Well, thanks, John, for that introduction. And thank you all for having me here today for this symposium. Uh, so I'm particularly excited to talk about this project. Um, let me figure out how to do the slides. Because I think it blends skills from two of my favorite uh, places. So this is me in the basement of UGA's library scanning a microfilm um, with some, a wildlife disease study from 1950. And then here's me in Zion National Park where I do my dissertation research on uh, the bacteria of squirrels that are very common among trails. Um, and so I think this project actually integrates a lot of looking at old literature and knowing the status of wildlife disease um, to really have applications into uh, production and management. So livestock is a predominant biomass where you hear a lot about wildlife disease, but if you compare wildlife to livestock over on the right, wild mammals are uh, something like a 25th of the degree of livestock biomass. And so our animals are predominantly um, livestock animals. And in particular, you see a magnitude of difference in the proportion of bacteria and viruses and pathogens. And so these are the most abundant uh, species, but often are not studied uh, for disease um, and because it's so biased towards humans and wildlife. And these infectious diseases can really decimate uh, livestock herds. So whether it be um, primarily pig disease like salmonella, which might require antimicrobial treatment or um, control methods to prevent uh, jumps into human populations uh, where a classic example is with Nipah virus uh, emergence, culling is really the only sustainable method to uh, break the transmission chain. And so often these infectious disease responses are reactive. So a new uh, pathogen emerges, um, it, um, a known pathogen is in a new host and we have to go back to the drawing board, develop new vaccines, try and uh, control an already um, spreading disease. And so the purpose of this project was really to say, how can we be proactive? How can we know, um, start to develop some of those interventions before uh, a catastrophic outbreak um, that might be you know, uncontrollable or going across country borders uh, be feasible. And we decided to, to focus on bacteria and swine in part because this is uh, work under the direction of the Swine Health Information Center, but also looking back at the, how uh, prevalent those uh, species are in our, in, on earth. And so the first step with this project is we just wanted to know what bacteria species are likely to uh, be associated with swine and what wildlife hosts um, are likely to carry those bacterial species and come in contact with swine. And then the second step is we know that particularly with bacteria, there's many commensals. Sometimes uh, bacteria species only become pathogenic when stress or other events um, cause that bacteria to cross a threshold. Uh, so even if we think a bacteria might be associated with swine, we really only care about the bacterial species that have an impact onto the swine industry. And so uh, a project led by uh, Michelle Evans, uh, who received her doctorate through the Drake Lab maybe two years ago, she did a horizon scan of all mammal bacteria and livestock, and she found over 1,600 different bacterial species are hosted by mammals. Um, 1,600 is a lot of bacterial species, so we wanted to actually focus on North American species, and that significantly uh, decreased the number of bacteria that are hosted by North American mammals to 353 bacterial species. So this was the data set that we started with to try and prioritize which of these bacterial species in all sorts of mammals um, might actually impact swine. And so in developing a predictive model, first step is definitely data acquisition. So we had this great data set um, from uh, Evans to develop, and then it's uh, to figure out, well, what are the traits of uh, the bacteria and wildlife species that we know. Um, 
And how can we then make predictions for those unknowns, these bacteria species that we don't know their relationship um, to swine? And so this requires us to go back to the literature, think about what covariates are important for bacterial exposure and bacterial infection into mammalian cells. Uh, we might have to do some manipulation and transforming of that data to make sure that covariates um, are independent and not biased. Uh, and then once we are equipped with our outcome variable, this association between a mammal and a bacteria, as well as the different covariates that might affect exposure and infection, um, we can build a model. So there's lots of different choices into what type of predictive model um, we built, uh, the different steps to uh, tr construct and train that model and then validate your findings. So we started with this North American mammal uh, bacteria data set, and there were 353 bacterial species and 319 wild mammals. And on this heat map, uh, the degree of red is the number of known associations. So you might see that there are a lot of white space uh, with, uh, between bacterial orders and different uh, mammal orders. So really those 979, that's a one, that's a positive association that we've detected a bacteria in a mammal species. But there are over 100,000 of these bacteria host pairs that are zeros. And that mean either uh, these bacteria won't infect that uh, host species or we just don't know yet. Um, it hasn't popped up in the academic literature yet. And some notes of that is 176 wild mammals in North America, we have no bacterial information on. Uh, and certainly uh, there's commensals and possibly pathogenic bacteria in all these vertebrate species. Um, so with more, more than half of the uh, wild mammals uh, having no bacterial information, um, it can kind of see, you can see where we are with wildlife surveillance at the moment. And only 60% of the bacteria are in one species. And so that might be because maybe bacterial uh, are more species specific, or that could be a sampling artifact. And so if you look at the known to unknown associations, we have a, a prevalence of about uh, just 1% of the possible uh, host pathogen associations are um, documented right now. And for North America, that's actually higher than the global uh, data set. So globally, it's um, less than 0.002 prevalence. Um, so North America is relatively well sampled compared to global data sets. Um, and I think this just means either more surveillance or better integration of known literature or gray literature um, is needed to uh, build up what is, what is the real knowns versus maybe just the literature knowns. And so I'm gonna walk you through what we, uh, all those traits we do for one of these mammal bacteria pairs. And so uh, this is the, one of my favorite animals, the raccoon, and they host uh, Clostridium Piliforme, which it causes Tizer's disease in raccoons, as well as many domestic and wildlife species. Um, and so first we're gonna just talk about the raccoon. So we were able to get taxonomic information about raccoons, so what um, order they uh, belong to. Um, we got lots of different life history um, information that might tell uh, us about their immune system and their um, exposure and contact rates among their populations. So this had to do with diet, activity, <coughs> body mass, litter size, and generation length. We got spatial information. So they're quite abundant all across uh, the North America, spanning over 129 uh, ecoregions. And uh, we have the distribution range area as well as where their uh, distribution centroid is. Uh, we were able to calculate 
uh, information from our database. So uh, raccoons host bacteria from 19 different bacterial families. So they have a, a lot of uh, bacteria as compared to, you know, most of the mammals in our data set have none or just one bacteria. And then we wanted to control for that research effort. And so we uh, calculated the number of uh, publications in PubMed, which is a medically focused uh, literature database. Similarly, we can do the, all those same mechanisms for uh, the pathogen. And so we uh, also get life history, physiological information, with uh, bacteria, we were able to get more genetic information, like their genome size and GC content. And we were able to calculate some other uh, metrics from our host bacteria database, the number of species that are hosted by this bacteria that host the bacteria, whether they're in humans or not, and um, the phylogenetic breadth. So how related are, or unrelated are the different hosts of this bacteria species? And lastly, we can think about the specific trait of that raccoon and clostridium pair. So uh, clostridium is hosted by uh, 23, uh, 25 other uh, North American mammals. And so we can think about what is the host isolation of uh, raccoons to all those other 25 hosts of clostridium. Uh, because we know that relatedness might relate to uh, how that bacteria attaches to cells and whether the immune system of the vertebrate um, can fight off or not fight off uh, bacterial infection. So ultimately, uh, we ended up with 24 traits. We, did, uh, we didn't uh, include traits that might uh, show a lot of the same trends. For instance, we found that the genome size was proportional to the number of genes of a bacteria. And so we only used one of those traits. So uh, we eliminated some of these redundant traits. Um, all of these traits are at species level. So definitely with bacteria uh, and with some mammal species, strains can be important, um, but we decided to approach this at the species level. And this was a tremendous effort uh, to aggregate all these different traits for uh, you know, hundreds of different species. Uh, so I just put a couple of those resources. And similarly, we can do, do all the same traits for all these negative associations. Um, this, I think, I didn't put it, but I think it's a, a sheep mycobacterium that's very specific to sheep and raccoons are not infected. But we can still calculate the traits and understand the traits of a positive association as well as a negative association. And so now we're going um, into our predictive model framework. We have our output variable, which is the ones and zeros of, do we see an association between this host and pathogen or not? And then we have all our input variables, which are those covariate traits. Um, and now we can move on to the modeling. Um, so I'm gonna skip over the actual model framework and I'm happy to speak with anyone who's interested with. Um, if I go back, uh, we used a boosted regression tree, uh, which is shown in the middle. And the point of a boosted regression tree is it allows us to put all these different traits um, and then subset and make decision trees based on if a trait um, might promote or uh, negate that type of association. And so if, if we subset a lot of data and then it makes almost an ensemble of many different decision trees that we can take these like maybe weak predictors um, to form a relatively strong model. Okay, so we had many different traits, but uh, if we plot the relative importance, we can actually focus maybe on the top six. And you can see that the most important are these traits calculated from our host bacteria data set. So what is the phylogenetic um, breadth of uh, these different um, bacterial species, um, how many bacterial families a, a host uh, might, uh, might uh, be associated with, um, some ranging behavior. So uh, the ecoregions, the number of ecoregions and host is um, which we're calling habitat breadth, um, as well as research effort. 
So now that we have a model that we have some traits that are really predictive of that association, we can apply it to those unknowns. And so we can think about swine's relationship with all of those different bacteria that are present in North America. So definitely swine are known to be infected by salmonella, but currently swine is not um, known to be infected by that uh, sheep mycobacterium or uh, Clostridium piliforme. And so if, here you see the 353 species and the uh, prediction, so which we call the propensity, so the likelihood that this bacteria species is to be in swine um, on the y-axis. And we, uh, the green are um, bacteria that do not currently associate with swine. Um, so you see there's this uh, very right-sided novel uh, bacteria that have uh, relatively low propensity scores. <coughs> um, but many of the known ba uh, swine bacteria are on the left in gray, and they have really high propensity scores. And so in order to discern, you know, well, which ones do we actually think are going to associate with swine? Where do we put a threshold on this propensity value? We operated on the least known case. So uh, the known swine bacteria, but with the lowest propensity score was 0.971. Um, and then you see it starts to drop off with the novel bacteria. And so we say everything above that threshold is a high propensity to be associated with swine uh, versus the bacteria species below. So ultimately it's 102 that we see as high propensity. And some of those are already known, but many of them are unknowns. Um, and so we can zoom in and we can start to see um, that least known case was this A. Hem um, and then uh, some of the novel uh, species that have really high propensity values. And so from here, we can get a ranked list of what novel bacteria are um, likely to be associated with swine versus uh, known bacteria. Um, and so here's 20, where we see that Bartonella hensile and Borrelia burgdorferi um, are most likely. Uh, as well as you know, many of these other 20 on the left. And then you also see our scores for those known bacteria that I'm sure many of y'all are familiar with. So what about the host? Um, we found 127 North American uh, mammals are associated with those 102 high propensity. Um, and you can see these maps. So there are some marine mammals as well as terrestrial mammals. 22 of the mammals uh, hosted more than 10 of these high propensity uh, bacterial species. So now we've been able to go from, you know, the 319 mammal species that are present in North America to just 22 that are hosting many bacteria species that are likely to infect swine. Um, top is the wolf, uh, and then uh, my friend, the raccoon, uh, going all the way down to uh, brown bear. 102 bacteria species, I still think is a lot. I certainly don't know the names of all those bacteria. And so we were interested in, well, how do we prioritize further? Um, we kind of had this high, low classification based on a certain threshold value. Um, but uh, how can we go further to prioritize which bacteria species we think um, you know, research dollars should go to? And so to do that, uh, we partnered with Schick and enrolled uh, experts. Um, so we uh, decided to send a survey of these 102 bacterial species out to swine health experts. And we identified seven impact categories of importance to the industry. Uh, this is animal, animal welfare, antimicrobial resistance, food safety, morbidity, mortality, production efficiency, and zoonotic potential. Okay, so we sent um, a Qualtrics survey uh, that both gauged uh, expert familiarity with these different species and impact categories, as well as actually garnered their opinion about how impactful um, these different bacterial species will be. 
And this was on a five point scale, zero having no impact, um, low, moderate, high to catastrophic impact. Uh, and so for, uh, for each, um, they were able to rank the familiarity. So had they even seen the species name before, as well as, um, as well as a ranking in each of these seven categories, what is the impact of uh, this bacteria? And then at the end, we did have some uh, long form answers. So were there bacteria species that we don't have in our list that are of concern to you? And um, what is your relationship with the field? So we sent this out to 40 uh, subject matter experts um, and 14 um, completed some part of the survey, five completed a total, um, the entire survey, uh, with, which is about a 12% response rate, which is pretty standard for these qualitative surveys. Um, and just an enormous amount of expertise from these different subject matter experts, uh, over 200 years of uh, working in the field. Um, and on average, this was a long survey. I mean, it was uh, assessing 100 plus bacteria in seven different impact categories. So it did take about 45, uh, 38 um, minutes to complete. And maybe not surprisingly, many of our experts were from swine heavy states. So uh, Iowa being best represented. And uh, our subject matter experts we're more likely to be familiar with swine bacteria, which makes sense uh, that uh, these novel bacteria that have yet to uh, infect uh, swine were less familiar to these um, experts. And you see some common um, swine uh, bacteria that are the most uh, familiar. So 26 bacterial species really didn't have any familiarity and um, only one subject matter expert was familiar with all the bacteria species. If you look at uh, familiarity, uh, familiarity was definitely highest in these industry related impacts. Um, so uh, animal welfare, morbidity, mortality, and production efficiency. The subject matter experts were less um, familiar with uh, antimicrobial resistance, food safety, and zoonotic potential. And one thing we did is we compared um, answers among these different impact categories. And we found that uh, sometimes uh, experts didn't, uh, many of the impacts were similarly responded to by experts. And so we simplified from that seven industry, um, seven impact factors to three uh, impact categories. In total, um, our uh, greatest variation among opinions are for these industry-related impacts uh, where the most unknowns um, or the less, uh, less impact is in categories of antimicrobial resistance or human outbreak category. And ultimately, uh, subject matter familiarity is tightly linked with industry impact. So these are the more likely that you know, there's a outbreak or a common uh, maintenance of certain bacteria species, the more likely uh, subject matter experts are, will be familiar with them. And so now we can actually take the, all the bacterial species and think about what type of impact will they have on the swine industry. And so we found um, 22 species are going to have a impact score of two or higher. Um, and only five of these are novel, uh, which this really focuses in from, you know, we started with 1600 bacteria to 300 plus in North America. Now we're at five novel bacteria species um, that are likely to have an impact on the swine industry. Uh, and so those five species are Anaplasma bovis, Clostridium botulinum, and Yersinia pestis and Klebsiella pneumoniae. Uh, and then you can uh, think about what wildlife hosts are known to be associated with those bacteria. So armed with those, that, we can now revisit the literature. So thinking about Yersinia pestis, I was kind of surprised there weren't more experimental studies. 
So I found one experimental study where it was from the 70s and they were infecting baby swine by offering them an infected rat to eat. Um, it wasn't, you know, a vector uh, experimental study. Um, they didn't develop any infections that way, but there was antibody responses. Um, and then from some observational studies, also rather outdated, we know that wild boar um, what can be sentinels and have a high uh, antibody titers. Um, we do know that many of plagues uh, vectors like Pulex species do feed on domestic swine, um, but I think this is a big you know, research gap. Similarly, uh, Anaplasma bovis is primarily a cattle-borne um, disease that's transmitted by ticks. Um, recently, it's been popping up in Southeast Asia and Malaysia and Japan um, in wild boar, but information on domestic swine is limited. Um, so just some, some conclusions from this. Uh, one is we can really predict uh, host pathogen relationships, largely using information about phylogeny, so the relatedness of the different hosts, the spatial distribution of those hosts, and the research effort of bacteria and um, hosts. Uh, there still are many gaps in wildlife surveillance and greater literature synthesis is needed um, to better build uh, these host uh, pathogen databases. And then by integrating expert opinions, you can start to make, um, uh-oh. Okay. Um, we can start to uh, really hone in on some research priorities. And I'm just gonna take a minute to uh, kind of think about how can we use the same approach for Japanese encephalitis because that's the reason we're all here today. And so um, we talked about how now we need to revisit the literature and further build up these um, literature databases and modeling approaches. So for uh, JEV, we could take a similar approach, but likely there would be some differences. So we focused on North American mammals, probably for Jap Japanese encephalitis virus. We might need to expand to all vertebrates because we know birds and water birds um, may be important for um, transmission and spread. Similarly, we likely need to get uh, covariant information about vectors um, that was largely ignored in our bacterial analysis. Um, but we might be able to, we, we can definitely do the same type of approach um, on all sorts of systems. And it really requires just knowing details about the life history and genetics of the host pathogen. Um, that we're approaching. And some preliminary work on that and looking at how uh, Japanese encephalitis virus compares in the host and vector overlap, we can see it's really similar to West Nile virus. So this is uh, several different flaviviruses and colored by their different um, vector-borne status. Um, and because Japanese encephalitis virus has so much similarity with West Nile virus, we might be able to pull information from previous West Nile outbreaks in the US um, to think about how JEV will uh, affect North American um, wildlife and livestock. So with that, I'll take any questions and I wanna thank Schick and the CEID um, for supporting this work. Any questions from the audience? Done. Natalia Chanichero from Kansas State. Thank you very much, Anna, for your presentation. So going back to one of the last slides that you show where you envision using these models, it's kind of a prioritization of, uh, um, of it, these potential bacteria or viruses by looking at these traits, the host, um, host and bacteria like you did, um, traits, looking at data from the literature and potentially also from experts. So how do you envision what, when you apply it for JV, what would be your primary outcome? Um, so I, I think like that is a, really good topic for maybe future brainstorming. I think with JEV, we looked at just 
pure association. And then our uh, expert survey was about impact. Um, but with JEV, it might be um, actual, you know, you could think about actual uh, viremia in the, uh, whether that is, we have enough data to link viremia amounts in certain species uh, to these traits. It could be um, just whether JEV will infect uh, different wildlife hosts and uh, particularly wildlife hosts in like novel environments um, like North America. So you could, are you saying that you could prioritize which hosts may be more relevant or more competent um, for a specific uh, outcomes, whether it's viremia, zero prevalence and so on? Definitely. I mean, I think all of the traits, uh, while, if I can go back. Um, so, the, I mean, these are traits specific to um, raccoons and Clostridium piliforme, but many <coughs> traits likely are going to be important for viral transmission as well. So, um, but with a JEV, we might tweak it to be, you know, uh, maybe use of water bodies or some other um, traits, but largely these host life history and spatial information, um, we could directly apply it to JEV um, and other flaviviruses. Um, similarly, you know, for bacteria, we were looking at these genetic measures and life history of the bacteria, but for the virus, it might be, you know, vector um, relationships uh, and, different uh, like mutation rates of the virus or other viral specific traits. Are there other questions? Uh, Eric, is, are there any questions from uh, online? Not yet. I'll remind the virtual attendees that if you would like to ask a question, <coughs> the chat button is disabled, but if you click the Q&A button, you can type your question to the speaker into the Q&A. Please. Hey, Steve Rick at USDA One Health. Um, one of the things, kind of looking at the general approach, you talk about so many of those those gaps, those over 110,000 unknowns. But you've got some of these neat scores for things like the host breadth and the kind of uh, um, uh, like bacterial range breadth as well. Can you use that to kind of? Uh, I don't want to use guess. That's kind of not the word I'm thinking about. But to, to kind of loosely fill in some of those gaps. And use the run a model with, with those assumptions in it, kind of almost like a sensitivity for how if we use what we know about the breadth and we've got some posts that are related, maybe that's not a zero, it's not a one, but it's like halfway there, and how that might change how this all works. So for we were specifically, oh gosh, I'm gonna be clicking through a bunch of slides. Um, okay, I think. Okay, so we were specifically interested in swine. We wanted to take these swine and known and unknown relationships and come up with propensity values. So our propensity values are a value between zero and one. And then we decided on a threshold. We, uh, the way the model is constructed, we get propensity values for all relationships. And so we could start to look into those wildlife relationships and, and give them their own threshold based on a least known case or some other threshold metric and see um, are there wildlife associations we uh, think are likely but unknown. Um, so we certainly can um, do that approach. I think with this project, we've seen how necessary swine expertise is. And so especially when you start applying it across all these wildlife, you really need uh, ecologists and veterinarians and diagnosticians to bring uh, their knowledge about specific species. Um, Other questions? Eric, any questions online? Thank you. And I thank you very much. Uh,